Kitco News Outlook 2024 is brought to you by iTrust Capital. Buy and sell crypto, gold, and silver with your IRA. Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safford and this is Kitco News. Now, the recent CPI data has sparked discussions about sticky inflation, particularly in the housing sector, which is influencing market perceptions and policy discussions as consumer price index rose 3.4% from a year earlier, the most in three months. And of course, the crypto landscape is evolving with the SEC's breaking, uh, groundbreaking rather, approval of 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs. Looking like some are selling the news today. We'll break it all down for you. And the looming uh, on the horizon is the U.S. election and an expanding budget deficit raising crucial questions about fiscal policy and economic stability. Now, to offer insights into these issues and to provide us with an outlook to 2024, we're joined by Jim Bianco from Bianco Research. Jim, welcome to Kitco News. Welcome back. Good to have you. Th thanks for having me. Now, uh, you recently shared a tweet, and I want to start by showing this on the screen. Uh, your tweet was regarding December CPI data, particularly focusing on the sticky nature of owner's equivalent rent, the OER, and its impact. It reads... Now, there's much talk about sticky CPI owner equivalent rest, the OER, for December printing 0.5% and pushing headline CPI to beat of to the beat of 0.3% for December. Many argue that this is wrong and that OER should be coming down. They need to take a look at it correctly. Here's a chart from the, uh, the cumulative changes of Zillow's rental index in black, the OER in orange, and rents of primary residence in red. Zillow is the real world, you call it, from 2013 to 2021. It tracks closely with OER and RPR's communal of changes, say that 10 times. Then starting in early 2024, Zillow raced ahead of the OER and the RPR. Uh, I want to get into this a little bit. You know, you're talking about the sticky inflation to close the gap with the real world. Uh, I'm curious, could you expand on this, particularly on how we should understand the relationship between these indices and what it suggests about the inflation landscape. Give, give us a, your longer-term forecast here, Jim. Yeah, so what this is, is this is a take on what you've seen politically in the U.S. <clears throat> the Biden administration keeps talking about the inflation rate is coming down. It was 9%. Now it's 3.4% as measured by CPI. You should be happy and celebrating it, but people have never been more glum because it's 20% higher than it was in 2020. So whatever took you $100 to uh, buy in 2020 takes you $120 to buy today. Right. Same thing with owner's equivalent rent and what we're seeing with housing inflation. Owner's equivalent rent is the way that they measure housing inflation. It's about 30% of all expenses in the United States. It's what you spend on your shelter, the biggest part of it. It's up according to the Zillow number, about 45% in the last 10 years. But the way that the government measures housing inflation, it's up about 28% or so. So it's undercounting the cumulative impact of housing inflation. And that's why I think that this housing part, 30% of CPI, is going to stay stronger than people think. It's not going to bring down the overall inflation rate. Now, why is that important? Because the narrative in the marketplace right now is the Fed is done raising rates. They are going to start cutting rates. The inflation rate in the parlance we use on Wall Street is we're in the last mile to 2%. And therefore, the stock market can celebrate by rallying. The bond market can celebrate by rallying. And what I'm arguing is we're not quite there on that last mile to 2%, that housing inflation, like overall inflation, has got a lot of cumulative gains built into it that is not being measured properly and that it will stay sticky, inflation will stay problematic, and I think it will ultimately frustrate the marketplace that is now pricing nearly seven rate cuts for all of 2024. Sure, the Fed may cut rates in 2024, but I'm not so sure that they're going to go all the way and go seven times. 
Yeah, no kidding. And I mean, you've mentioned it. There's priced in uh, some big price action here. When you're looking at the long-term forecast, is there anything that's been surprising for you? Break it down for the people at home, particularly investors looking for guidance here. Yeah, um, what has been surprising to me is the sanguineness of, of what we saw in the bond market. In August of 2020, the 10-year U.S. yield hit half a percent, 50 basis points. It hit 5% in October of 2023 before it backed off to about 4% where, where it is right now, roughly speaking. Um, from that move from half a percent to 5%, according to a lot of data, that was probably the worst move on a bond investor total return basis since the Civil War in 160 years. And investors were throwing money in, we're bullish on bonds, throwing money in, bullish on bonds, taking from a bond market perspective, the worst losses in 160 years. Then we got November and December where the market rallied and they said, see, see, I lost 50% of my money, but I made 10% of it back. I was right all along. And they're sitting with massive losses. And so that's really what's been really surprising to me in my sarcasm in that previous statement is that they have not been scared or worried or defensive about the big move. They think it's overdone. They think that rates are going to come down. And that's what is the basis for the current move. In other words, I think what they've done is they've become anchored to the old QE period from 2010 to 2020, that they somehow think that zero interest rates are, is normal. And what mm -hmm. we're seeing now is abnormal. And I think that's backwards. Zero interest rates was the abnormal period. This is a lot closer to what we would consider normal. So what are you thinking about some normality in terms of this year? I mean, people often thinking that March will see a couple of interest rates being cut. Uh, when do you think the timing is here? And what does it mean towards the end of the year? When do you think that this curve will start to even out? Yeah, so <clears throat> right now, the marketplace is, does not have a hike or excuse me, a cut priced in for January. Right. It is slightly above 50% for March, but there's a lot of data that could come, and it's nearly about 90% for May. So that's kind of the March-May is when they're looking for the rate first rate cut. And I think that that's going to be dependent on the type of data that we see and if we see any kind of weakness in the economy. And as long as we don't see any kind of surprise that could come along and upset this uh, idea that we're in the last mile of inflation. and I'll just casually mention on the surprise side, the Red Sea and the shipping problems can be that exact surprise if they mm -hmm. turn out to be protracted problems. Everybody on Wall Street is correct to say Red Sea problem is not a problem. Right now, this minute, if it continues and continues and continues, as it has been for the last couple of weeks, it will be a problem. Tell me when it ends and I'll tell you how bad it's going to be. And Right now, I don't see a, an immediate resolution. And the def definition of a re resolution is unarmed container ships can traffic the Red Sea without incident. We're a ways away from that right now. If they have to go around Africa, uh, it's going to delay shipping in a just-in-time world. And that could be a big problem. But that aside, I think Wall Street's looking past that problem. It's looking past all the other problems. And it sees optimism right now. Now, I share some of that optimism that I think that the economy is not necessarily going to have a soft landing, that it might continue to beat on the upside, surprise people with its strength. But I think that that strength is going to buoy or hold up inflation. And inflation is the crux of what we're talking about with all these rate cuts. So yes, the market looks like it's going to start cutting rates in spring. Uh, my personal opinion is, is that I'm a little skeptical of that. And I think that the inflation rate's going to stay a little sticky, and interest rates are going to stay higher for longer, that other phrase that Wall Street likes to use. Yeah, yeah. And we'll keep an eye on the news for the Red Sea as well. Obviously, a lot going on over there. Uh, I'm curious over to crypto. Let's switch over there a little bit. A uh, huge week in that space with the SEC approving 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs. Of course, the day before, we had a tweet go out from the SEC stating that it was approved, which turned out to be a hack. That caused a rally in Bitcoin. A day later, it was actually approved. 
And I know many of us, including here at Kitco, waited for an official statement so that we knew that it was actually confirmed. It's been a whirlwind. So, Jim, break down the crypto world for us, particularly what it means for institutional and retail investors having these ETFs approved and where we're at. This has probably been an, the most unique uh, process of approving an ETF that anyone has ever seen, all the way down to the point where they started a fee war on who was going to have the lowest fee before they even started to trade. And they already drove the fees for several of them down to zero before they even started to trade um, at this point. The great hope is, and I'll use the crypto terms here, normal people or normies, as we like to call them, are now have an, a, a venue to buy Bitcoin directly. It was too difficult to go to a cryptocurrency exchange or go to a decentralized exchange uh, to buy these things. But now you can buy them directly in your brokerage account, in your retirement account, in your bank account. You can buy a Bitcoin ETF. And the great hope was this was going to open the floodgates and a bunch of normie money was going to start flowing in. That's why the price doubled in the previous four months in anticipation of this. Well, the problem is, there's an old adage on Wall Street, you know, you buy the rumor and you sell the news. Well, the news started yesterday morning when these Bitcoin ETFs started to trade. Bloomberg estimates about $750 million of new money came in just yesterday. And now the price is down 12% from the open on yesterday. So none of that $750 million has a profit. And any other normie, to stick with that term, that wants to come into this space has got to look and say, no one's made any money because in their world, Bitcoin started yesterday. Uh, and so this is going to be the big issue is, is all of that normie money going to continue to flow in to support the price or did we overhype it? And it's a sell the news thing. Now, I happen to hold to opinion, we did overhype it. It is a sell the news thing. We could be in the, in this, in the face of a vicious correction right now, but- if you can look past that and you could say, you know, I want to buy Bitcoin and I'll check it in two years or three years, right. I, I would be, you know, optimistic that you'll show a decent profit under that type of time, time frame or five years. But if you want to buy it now because it's volatile and it's been going up and you want to make a lot of money quickly, you're going to probably be disappointed because I think what we've got is we've got to sell the news over hype coming on Bitcoin next. Yeah, give us a little bit more analysis here of your expectations in 2024. Longer term here, it seems like this could be an interesting correction. Where do you think we're going to fall? Do you think these inflows have made sense? Uh, where are we here in 2024? Uh, I think that the inflows have made sense. I mean, there is going to be, for normies and for everybody else, probably billions of dollars that's going to flow into cryptocurrencies. Uh, but I just don't think it's going to come as quickly as they think it's going to come. So no. on a correction, I could see it going down, you know, into the low 30s, maybe the high 20,000s before it finds some kind of a support and then, you know, a base and then it starts to uh, take off again. So buy the dip. Is that what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> yes. I it, but buy the dip with it with a little bit longer time frame than, you know, the next 24 hours a week. Yeah, of course. Uh, let's switch over here. Qu quarter four earnings coming out. The season has begun with expectations of a slight decline in the S&P 500 earnings compared to the previous year. Obviously, we're seeing that in economic data, too. Uh, what insights do you have about how this might reflect the current state of the economy and influencer, uh, sorry, and influence investor sentiment in the market? I mean, where are we going here? What can we expect over, say, the next six months in the equity side? Yeah. So earnings just started this morning, literally, with some of the big banks that reported, and and J.P. Morgan reported kind of a so-so number, but they're just the first of 500 companies uh, essentially that are going to be reporting over over the next uh, month or so. Uh, typically, earnings will beat those expectations that you cited. Um, you know, on average, about 75 percent of companies will beat what Wall Street guesses. Um, that's because it's kind of a bit of a game where they play, where the Wall Street analysts undercount the company beats, and then they give the company glowing reports for beating. But I think that if they do beat like they typically do, 
the numbers would probably come in and be fairly healthy to say that at least at a nominal pace, I mean, just the overall economy is continuing to expand and we're not having a soft landing. Um, and on, on balance, that's good. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in this environment in 2024, what investors have to think about is the competition for stocks. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Siegel wrote a new uh, update to his book, Stocks for the Long Run. In it, he says, what is the long run potential for the stock market? 8% a year. Now, you don't get it every year. For the last two years, you've gotten zero. But he says, if you bought stocks and held them for many, many years, you should expect about an 8% return. Okay, in 2019, when the, when the funds rate was at zero, money market funds were at zero, we coined the term TINA. There is no alternative because what are you going to do if you're not in stocks? You're going to earn zero in a money market fund? Well, in 2024, that money market fund is earning you over 5%. It's giving you about two-thirds of the return that the stock market might be able to offer you without any market risk. How much aggressiveness are you planning on doing to get that final third? And the answer is, I don't think very much. That's why a trillion and a half dollars went into money market funds, not nearly as much as went into stock funds. And if these earnings numbers are good and the economy is good and it keeps inflation sticky and it keeps interest rates up, people will say, the economy is doing good. And the answer is, investors will give is yes. And my money market fund will keep yielding me 5%. And I'm happy right there. I'm getting most of the gains and I can sleep at night. I don't have to worry about a stiff correction in the stock market. Uh, and so that's really what you know the, the, the stock market struggles with in 2024. It's not, is it going to be good earnings and is it going to be a good economy? It's, can you beat the alternative, which is giving you most of what the stock market should offer you anyway? And that is what we're going to have to contend with, which is why I think Wall Street's so desperate for lower interest rates. So they could then tell everybody you've you know, Tina is back and you have to get back into the stock market. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of people looking at the balance sheets of some of these bank numbers too, just seeing where credit is when it comes to the consumers. Or is there anything specific that you're looking for in terms of this whole credit crisis? Um, not anything specific in per se. I think really what I'm I'm looking at is, you know, more of the industrial and the mainline and the basic materials companies. These tend to be the companies that borrow the most and are most susceptible to the real world. I, I want to see if they can continue to refinance. On the financial side, I think that the story will continue to be whether or not the banks and the private credit uh, that have extended loans to real estate are continuing, especially commercial real estate and in particular office real estate, which has really been struggling greatly. If, uh, if those financial institutions can find a resolution to those poor performing loans without just taking massive losses. Um, so far, the jury's out on that. We just don't, we don't have a resolution yet. There's hope that maybe office real estate has found a bottom. Um, you know, there's others that are a little bit more pessimistic about it. Uh, I just think that, you know, if you're going to be an investor in the space that involves financials and real estate, commercial real estate, residential being a different story altogether, that that has been an area that has been very, very difficult. The returns have been poor. The structural stories, especially with office and remote work, have been have been tough to overcome. And I think that that's going to be a place that will offer a lot of risk and a lot of potential. But let me emphasize that first word, a lot of risk. Yeah, certainly a lot of vacancies in the office spaces uh, everywhere you seem to go these days. Now, with the Congressional Budget Office projecting federal deficit averaging $2 trillion per year from 2024 to 2023, and then there's a challenging fiscal outlook with high and rising federal debt, where is the U.S. economy at? Let's not forget that we're heading into an election year here. Give us a breakdown and give us your overview of 2024, what we're expecting to see here. We're going to see a lot of debt. We're going to see a lot of deficits, uh, you know, just basically from what you uh, described accurately. Typically, borrowing debt is pulling consumption forward. Why do you take out a mortgage in your 30s to buy a house? Because in your 60s, you could probably write a check for it, but you need the house when you're in your 30s to raise your family. So you've pulled that, you've pulled that uh, forward to the 30s. Well, it's the same thing with debt. When the government borrows money, the government spends it. It creates economic activity. 
is what it does. So if we're going to run big budget deficits, we're going to be spending money. We're going to be creating economic activity, and that's going to keep the economy moving along. And again, my contention is economy moving along also means sticky inflation and higher interest rates. They don't want that part, but they're going to get the first part of the economy moving along. And uh, actually, it's been very rare with deficits this big that you actually see the economy start a recession because you're creating economic activity by borrowing money and spending it. Is what you, So I, that's what I expect to see as we move forward, that the economy will continue to chug along and move, um, and move ahead. Uh, the problem was going to come in, is, of course, is the government's going to have to borrow that money, and they're going to have to borrow that money at what maturity? The 10-year, are they going to issue more 10-year bonds? Are they going to issue more 30-year bonds? Are they going to issue more five-year bonds? Well, Wall Street was all excited when in November that on their quarterly refunding announcement, they said they would issue less of those than people expected and more treasury bills. Now, the next quarterly refunding announcement comes out in early February, but we might be in a position where they have no choice. They have to issue more 10-year notes and they have to issue more 30-year bonds and that that will create a bit of a supply problem for the bond market as well. So I expect to see that the economy will continue to move ahead on, I like to use the word nominal basis. Nominal means real growth, which we want, plus inflation, which is what we don't want. But you put together two to together and nominally, the economy should probably still stay very strong, I think, in 2024, especially with all that deficit spending. Yeah, Jim, so much to break down. It'll be very interesting to watch where we land here. Jim Bianco from Bianco Research joining us today to break it all down for us. Jim, thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. And thanks again for tuning in to Kitco News. I'm Jeremy Safford. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and download our app for all the latest breaking news. We'll see you next time. Kitco News Outlook 2024 is brought to you by iTrust Capital. Buy and sell crypto, gold, and silver with your IRA.